name is David Matz. Uh, I teach at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. I teach conflict resolution, and I'm a partner in a mediation firm. And in the last two and a half years, we've been working on a large, uh, let's call it fact-finding case, involving the development of guidelines for doctors in dealing with uh, the PSA test for uh, prostate cancer. In healthcare, with all of the scientific turmoil and contest and uh, confusion, one of the things that's been invented, as you probably know, are guidelines for practitioners and now with the web for patients. When to do this test, when to use this medication, when to do this or that. And there's actually a small industry of developing and evaluating guidelines. The PSA, since 1988, has been the sort of ex one of the accepted tests for prostate cancer. And then starting around 10 years ago, it began to be challenged. Uh, on a whole variety of grounds, the easiest one to describe is false positives. A fairly high rate of false positives showing up, which led to biopsies, which led to treatment, which led to infection, and indeed in some cases death. And so there's now been a challenge as to whether this is a good thing to do in the shorthand of the trade, whether the harms outweigh the benefits of using it, and within that question, for whom, at what age, in what kind of family background, etc. So there's a great deal of turmoil uh, around that question, and this is probably important. The idea for this project started with a researcher in a medical school. He himself is also a clinician, so it, it was a personal thing. Basically, I don't know what to do. I read the science. I know how to read science. I still don't know what to do. I imagine you know, my practitioner friends all over the country don't know what to do. I need to do something. And so he had the idea of putting together a panel, and there's an outfit called PCORI. PC is the patient-centered, and I don't remember the rest of it, but it's a spin-off of the Obama monies, which are meant to develop ways in which more of things done in healthcare are patient-centered. So looking at that set of guidelines, uh, Dr. Luckman had the idea of putting together a panel which would have primary care docs, urologists, state regulators, people, uh, risk managers in various uh, institutions, as well as patients, seven patients out of 21 as it happens, uh, and hire professional facilitators to design and conduct the process, and that's how we got it. He also put together, and this is very important for this kind of an audience, a panel of scientific experts, expert in a variety of things. He appointed them, so they didn't come from size, they came from the sponsoring person. And I have to say, I was part of the process where he was putting it together, it was a lot of by guess and by God. It wasn't, oh, we have two of these and two of those, a blue one and a green one. It was just who's will, who sort of has status and is willing to show up and do the work. So there wasn't a lot of great thinking that went into who ought to be doing this sort of thing. And that turned out actually to have some difficulties later on. The si there was a number of scientific conflicts in this area. One of them is simply how do you count harms and benefits, subcategory, how do you define harms and benefits. There were a number of studies that have gone into this, done both here and in Europe, but they are all methodologically flawed in varying ways Sometimes because they're so different, they use different kinds of sampling groups, they use different methodologies, they use different definitions. So it's very hard to compare the science of one to another. Then it turns out that black males have a different rate of prostate cancer and a different virulence of prostate cancer. So there's a whole question of how to take account of that difference in this kind of a panel. Subpopulation. Subpopulation issue, that meant we knew that up front, and so it had to do with who we invited into the panel. That didn't turn out to be as easy, finding black males who were willing to serve. We did find two, each of whom presented challenges during the process, one of whom de facto dropped out. He never said he was dropping out, he just stopped showing up. Was that a function of how we designed it? Was there something, and I happen to be the person assigned to reach out to him, major failure. I neither brought him back in nor learned very well why he wasn't. He was wonderful on the phone, apologized, I'm really interested, I'm doing all the reading, I'm really ready, I'll see you Tuesday night, I'll be there. The other black male also presented a difficulty, I'll come to that in a second. And then, of course, as all of you are used to, the science changed. We, this was a nine-month program, and right in the middle, new studies came out that really made a difference. Worse than that, rumors that new science was coming out got into the room. And so there was a question, well, what do we do with that? We, we hear there's this guy at UC Irvine who's about to do something. What do we, how do we deal with that? And you'd call them and ask, and you'd get answers of a sort of, well, yes, but I'm not quite ready. And so that was another variable that we, we had to work with. We also had the question, taking patients very seriously, and as it turns out, I think not quite seriously enough, uh, what do patients want? You know, are they there, first of all, as individuals, or are they there representing 
patience, whatever that means. But there's question one. The PSA was part of the culture. Every doc did it. Any male over a certain age sort of knew that it's going to happen. But the PSA is just a blood test. You're doing blood tests anyway. So why not? It's another $10, and it's a non-invasive, or at least no more invasive than the blood test is anyway. So it was one of these accepted things. Now it's being said that there's something wrong with it. Now, you can study it, and it, it doesn't seem to be terribly serious. <coughs> Here, there's something wrong with it. It makes patients nervous. Why are we doing this? They're starting to raise these questions with docs. Should the doc this, and some patients were quick to say, I don't want to decide this. You're the doc, you decide. Or should it be a joint process? If so, what kind of information should there be to help the patient? And an interesting question that we never resolved well, should wives be involved? For all the obvious reasons, they are relevant. So you get this question of where do you draw the circle of who's at the table. There were a number of women at the table who were wives, but they were not brought to the table as wives. So there was this question of what role do they play and what voice do they use in the conversations among the panelists. Uh, there were also other guidelines. Uh, this thing got triggered because there's an outfit called the National Task Force on Guidelines, which produced guidelines which said never use PSA again ever for anything, which rattled the profession enormously. All kinds of professions. The urologists went bonkers because if you get a high score on the PSA, your doc instantly says, go see your urologist. So it was a major hunk of income traveling from PSA to urology. When the task force came out and said, never again for any human under any circumstance, it didn't quite go that far, but it was close, it really rattled the, the cage for the urology profession. They're an important professional outfit. That, in some measure, had something to do with our, the creation of our panel, because people felt, that, felt they'd gone too far. We had a couple of strategies as facilitators, and we, there was a tremendous amount of consultation. There was a management team of which the facilitators were a part, the sponsoring doc, and several of the experts. And we would meet a couple of times a week on the phone conference call. What do we do now? What do we do about this? How do we handle the next meeting? What about this webinar? There was a whole lot of stuff that went on. The primary thing we worked on was education of the panelists, because it was very complicated science, and it was, and as I say, it wasn't clear. There were methodological <coughs> problems. We needed to get at that. We were prepared with the idea that, of course, the patients will have trouble absorbing all this science and making use of it. We want them to be comfortable. We had special webinars for patients. <coughs> what we hadn't counted on was that the docs would have more trouble. And part of the more trouble came from the fact that the docs couldn't admit that they were having trouble, because they're supposed to know how to deal with reading science. And they didn't. The patients were comfortable saying, well, look, I don't understand all these numbers and these charts. I mean, can somebody help me with this? That was comfortable. Could, that was a big opening. And we sat down and worked out all sorts of things to help. The docs were less comfortable. The docs, for example, were invited to the webinars and didn't come. Then they'd come to the next meeting and blatantly not understand the science. Uh, so that presented an interpersonal delicacy of how, who, okay, who's going to talk to him? Do you get him? Do I get him? Do we send a doc to talk to him? Do we send a non-doc? That might be a better idea. There was a lot of delicacy around that. We assumed that all the urologists were going to defend the use of the PSA because that was their income. Wrong again. Two of the urologists were very open and very eager to uh, explore and see how this might go. One urologist lived up to our caricature, the urologist, and was defending till the death. And we worked out a little process for working with him, mainly working with the other two urologists, to help him get past a certain point. The docs had their own issues because several of the docs we got in, one of the major issues, I'm sure you run into it all the time, was representation or not. What are you representing? Are you representing an industry? Are you representing yourself? Or in the case of a, three of the PCPs, they were representing their, their medical practice. And the practice uses PSA. I can't come in here and vote no when my firm says yes. That became its own issue. Could we go talk to the practice? How far could we go outside the table? Where was legitimacy? Where was comfort for the doc? If we go past the doc, how will she feel with the people she works with? And we did. We went, we went past the docs, actually. The measure, or the comparison, really, of harms and benefits was this, the core vocabulary. How do you compare harms and benefits? No logical way to do it. And we had dozens of ways, and there were studies that tried to do it, and they were fundamentally not helpful for a number of reasons. Right in the middle of the process, out comes another study, which instead of <coughs> using interviews as the base data which the others had used, it used mathematical modeling. And if this is true for a man from 62 to 66, and with the average age that he's going to live to is 89, then here are the number that are going to get prostate cancer, and we can we can project. That produced a wonderful little table of ratios. Harms to benefits. It would be 4.2 to, to 2 here, but if we start 
the testing men at an earlier age, it changes to 4.6. And all of a sudden, we have this wonderful little formula for measuring these things. And everybody goes, and it's three quarters of the way through where we're really frustrated because it's really hard to figure out how you compare these things. And everybody appreciates that difficulty. Suddenly, there's an answer. And it comes in a two-number ratio. I mean, it can't get more user-friendly than that. The facilitators had a very serious, painful meeting. Everybody's ready for agreement. God knows we want agreement. But mathematical modeling buries an enormous number of assumptions. And they're not in the article. Some of the articles sort of say, and we've made some assumptions about in a rather casual way. What's our job? Is it our job to go out there and open up those assumptions? Do we simply raise the doubts for the group? Do we say, stop, we can't use this, we need to bring in a guy named Galati, who was the chief scientist on the major paper? Do we need to invite Galati to come in and do a, a lecture for us on the assumptions they made and where they went? That'll slow things down. Will that screw up reaching agreement? I became a dissenter. I wanted to bring in Galati in some form. We could have brought him in on Skype. We had a bunch of easy ways to do that. There was just too much sense of momentum, deadline, and energy level. People are getting tired. Four big panel meetings, and God knows how many subcommittees and webinars and things that went on in between. And everybody's getting tired. And the feeling of my colleagues was, if we do that, we will start breaking the back. Because then they're going to have to start digesting a whole new set of scientific information that come out of the... Uh, assumptions that are buried in there. So we made the decision. The group has not asked for this. The group is content to use this data. We're going to continue using this data. The last issue had to do with that other black male who at the very last <coughs> session we had polled everybody. We thought we were going into a pro forma summit meeting where we had it all together and we had a few little loose ends to tie up. And we said, okay, we seem to have consensus. We've talked to everybody. Everybody seems on board. Any last minute questions? Probably a dumb question. Never want to ask that one again. Because it, it, this fellow raised his hand. He said, well, you know, you're talking about one particular time. What, what age do you start the testing? And we had said age 50 for black males, 45, because of the higher incidence and, and the greater danger. So we start them five years younger. He said, I can't agree to that. Pause. I'm on the board of a, a health clinic which serves primarily the black community. We've been working for years to get black males to get tested, and we've used the number 40. I can't go back and just change our entire political stance with regard to the black community just because you guys decide 45 is the right number. i got to use 40. And this was a kind of, I mean, you know, there's no time to prepare. There was no background. We're just sitting there with 20, 21, and we got a great turnout, by the way. The attendance records were fantastic for, the, for this group. So we had 21 people sitting there, and we didn't know what to do. We worked with him and, you know, what's possible, and we did all of the standard mediating stuff, trying to figure out is there an accommodation. And finally, several of the people in the room, it, the one way to make it work would be to drop all the numbers down five years, so that black males would be 40 and everybody else would be 45, which did not fit our own sense of the science, which did not fit with the urologists who had just come out with a, their own recommendation, and we wanted to, there was a good reason to want to not be too different from the professionals since they were close enough to what we wanted to do anyway. This would have thrown us off completely. But in fact, we had to find in the politics of the room a black male being a dissenter was going to be a really tough sell because you've got to sell these guidelines to other audiences. I haven't gone into that, but we don't get to enact the guidelines. We get to recommend them to, to other groups. So we moved the whole thing. We moved it down five years. There was a good, and there was some writing. Chief Scientist was a spectacularly good writer, and he wrote a wonderful explanation, which was about 98% honest. <coughs> um, hey, that's, I don't know why you're laughing, that's good. In 98, I'm really proud about why we did that, where we come from, why we made the, that we made an adjustment. We made the adjustment for this reason. He didn't say, this guy never bothered to mention in the first seven months that he had this other obligation that we didn't know about. And so we did come up with a consensus, which is now moving along. In the guidelines or whatever you did develop up front, was, was there an agreement that there would have to be unanimity among the no. group? No. We I, had I'm really surprised that, the, that they caved in, for example, to that. Well, it had to we, do we're with... We're doing this because this is what we've always done, kind of a mentality right. that can be discussed. The answer is no, we didn't have to insist on unanimity. Uh, we talked about consensus in its various meanings early up front, what we would try to do, what we were willing to settle for, the role of dissenters. We, we had sort of built that in. But this is, this is Boston, this is, and these are guidelines for Massachusetts. Uh, it's a black male. The 
audience that's going to take it from us is going to care a lot about, and, and black males have different incidents and different virulence, and so it's, it, it's more than a vote. Is there any distinction between practitioner doctors and research doctors, and why wasn't there somebody from Harvard Medical School that really wanted to elevate the state of the art and criticize the, the norm? I, I don't get that, especially well, in Massachusetts. Actually, there were two guys from Harvard Medical School. Well, right. But um, why, why the protection of the status quo as opposed to rethinking and really... Rethinking dying? which kind of an issue? Well... On what, that 40, exactly. 45... Oh, the no, number. No, the, the, the indication of what best practices would be. Because one of the... That's not one of the ghosts at the table. The seven practitioners at the table were speaking to the issue of we've got to get this to be usable. And there are docs out there who have, I, was, I learned, mm -hmm. any doc doing a standard workup of a male has got 42 tests in his head for different kinds of things. And he's got to know or she's got to know where, where those tests are. And they don't have time to go out and do research. They need to make a decision. Yes, David gets the PSA. No, David doesn't get the PSA. And they got 42 of those. Mm -hmm. So it had to fit in with the general mentality of a practitioner of what's possible, how much data they could absorb, how many vari uh, variations they could live with. And so was, no, this was not revolution That was time. agreed to in the terms of reference of this process. That is correct. We are talking to practitioners okay. who are out there today. 